In the preceding lesson, we gained a fundamental understanding of modal analysis. Now we will take this understanding and apply the concept to two different structures. Our first example will be the application of modal analysis to a simple structure, a tuning fork. The second example will be the application to a much more complex structure, a skyscraper. So let's have a look at our first example, the tuning fork. So a tuning fork is a very simple structure made of a single part and material, yet it still illustrates the concept of natural frequency and mode shape very nicely. A tuning fork, when struck or excited, will vibrate at a dominant natural frequency that matches a specific musical note. It can then be used to tune a musical instrument like a guitar or a violin. Here we see the tuning fork vibrating in slow motion and the deformation shape or mode shape that dominates is clearly visible. So now looking at the tuning fork, what would be the most important dimension of the fork that governs the natural frequency? Or if we were to add weight to the tips of the forks, would the frequency go up or would it go down? Let's use a simulation model of a tuning fork to answer these questions. We have a simulation model of a tuning fork and it is oscillating at 440 hertz but the animation is slowed down so it can easily be seen. Now recall from our preceding lesson, we learned about the eigenvalue problem. The equation is shown here and the solution for a general structure with many degrees of freedom requires an eigensolver. But if we saw this equation on a single degree of freedom system, like a mass on a spring, and that mass on a spring can just oscillate in one direction, the solution of this can simply be solved using algebra giving the natural frequency is the square root of the stiffness k over the mass m. Now, we can keep this equation in mind when thinking of more complex systems, as it can help us intuitively understand the expected behavior of the system. So getting back to our tuning fork, it is not a single degree of freedom system, but we can think of it like a cantilever beam. Where that beam is bending and the beam acts like a simple spring, and the mass of the beam is the mass hanging on that spring. Now a cantilever beam is fixed on one end and it's free on the other. If we have a long beam and push on the end, it will deflect more than a short beam. So a long beam is less stiff than a short beam. Now relating this back to the tuning fork, if we make the fork arms longer, the stiffness k decreases and what happens to our natural frequency? In the equation, we can see the natural frequency omega will decrease with decreasing stiffness k. So making our tuning fork longer results in lower natural frequencies, and that's exactly what we see from the simulation results in this graph. Here we show how the length of the fork and the resulting natural frequencies vary. Now we ask the question, what happens if we were to add weight to the tips of the fork? Again, thinking of the tuning fork as a cantilever beam, it acts like a spring. A longer beam we just learned is softer, shorter, is stiffer. Now putting a mass on the tip of that beam, or spring, we see from our equation that if we increase the mass, the resulting frequency will decrease. Now let's move on to our second example, which is considerably much more complex construction compared to a tuning fork. Yet what we will see, the same equation applies and hence we can use the same intuitive understanding and expected behavior of a much simpler system. The Burj Khalifa is currently the tallest skyscraper in the world at the recording of this lesson, and it stands 830 meters tall. The modal analysis is a critical primary requirement to understanding the fundamental dynamics of the structure. Understanding how the skyscraper will respond to forces such as seismic, earthquake, or aerodynamic, like wind loading, are critical not only to the safety, but also to the comfort of the occupants of the skyscraper. While the Burj Khalifa was specifically designed aerodynamically to minimize harmonic excitation from the wind, which could be disastrous, it still responds to wind forces, which excite the skyscraper's primary natural frequencies, and it even sways approximately two meters at the very top. So to explore the concept of modal analysis applied to a large skyscraper, a very simplified representation of the skyscraper was constructed for illustration purposes. Now considerable details have been omitted. In the detailed model, there would be representation of all the walls and all the columns, as well as any mass that may not contribute to the stiffness of the building, 
such as the equipment and non-structural features of the building, such as its finishing. All the stiffnesses and mass from the elements that make up the complex construction of the building go into the stiffness and mass matrices of the eigenvalue problem, and we solve for the mode shapes and the modes. We fix the base of the building and we run a modal analysis, extracting the first 15 modes. The modal analysis results show typical and expected behavior for such a tall, slender structure. Three modes are shown here for discussion. Now mode number one is the first bending mode, and if you look at its deformed shape or eigenvector, we see it behaves very much like a cantilever beam or even our tuning fork. Now recall that we have just as many modes as degrees of freedom, and this model has thousands of degrees of freedom. But let's just look at a few other shapes. Mode number three is the second bending mode, and notice it looks very similar to mode number one at the tip. But if you look closely, you will notice the middle of the building is moving in the opposite direction to the tip. Now mode number five is the first torsion mode, and notice this deformation shape is very different than the others. If a building was not made stiff enough, and its design permitted to be excited in the torsion direction, say by some wind, the building would rotate about its axis. And this twisting motion could also make the occupants near the top feel uneasy as the building rotates beneath them. So this brings us back to the significance of modal analysis to the design. The building must not only be stiff to minimize bending, it must be stiff torsionally to minimize rotation. And the aerodynamics of the building must be considered as to not excite this mode of deformation or any modes of deformation. Recall that the magnitude of deformation is not significant in a modal analysis and there is no excitation. We have not specified any loading on the building, so we just view these deformations to understand their relative shapes, not their magnitude or degree to which they deform. So looking at these shapes, which shapes are the most significant? We can use our intuition, but we can also use some of the other quantities such as the participation factor, and the effective mass, which we introduced in the preceding lesson. Looking at the effective mass percentage, we see the first two modes have the highest effective mass ratio of around 30% in the lateral direction, not in the vertical. And mode 14 is the highest in the vertical direction. These are some of the most significant modes. Now, as we get to higher frequencies, typically their individual percentages will decrease, but their summed contribution is still important. Exploring that thought a bit more, we notice that the total percentage of effective mass is much less than 100. And this indicates that for modal-based dynamic simulation, such as performing an earthquake simulation or wind simulation, we would use these modal results in, we would need more modes than computed here, these 15. Now intuitively, does it make sense a skyscraper has such low natural frequencies, while a tuning fork has relatively much higher natural frequencies? If we think of the skyscraper in terms of a single degree of freedom system, and again use the simple equation of omega equals square root of k over m, we know that the skyscraper has a relatively high mass compared to the tuning fork, and due to the slenderness of the skyscraper, it has a relatively low lateral stiffness. This combination results in a typically low fundamental first frequency of large civil engineered structures like tall skyscrapers. Finally, what features of the design give the skyscraper its lateral and bending stability and increased stiffness? The building has what is called a buttress core design. It is in the shape of a Y. This cross-sectional shape provides stiffness in both the bending and the torsion direction, and it increases progressively from the top of the building to the bottom. This helps make the building stable even at a height of 830 meters.